So, I would like, first of all, personally thank very warmly Marcus, who invited me, and we can applaud him. And for me, it's a great honor to be invited, both as a chair and as a commentator for this opening session. As a chair, I just want to say that I appreciate the choice of this issue, the futures we want, global sociology and the struggles for a better world. Yes, we have to think globally. Yes, a main task for sociology is to analyze struggles. Maybe I could add that struggles for a better world could be opposed to hatred, violence, destruction, self-destruction, what I could call in my vocabulary social anti-movements, and that maybe it could be useful to study together the good and evil, struggles for a better world on the one hand, and on the other hand, violence, racism, xenophobia, antisemitism, terrorism, and so on. I would like to say a very, very short word about language. I have here some linguistic perplexity. As sociologists, we usually have a strong interest for cultural diversity. We like to discuss multiculturalism, cultural rights, and we know that speaking in one's own language is important. As members of the ISA, we know that we have three official languages, English, Spanish, and French. And being hosted in Austria, in Wien, we know that the language here is German. This is why I consider that it is a kind of regression for us, and I hope in the future, in a better future, this will change. I consider as a regression not to have simultaneous translation, not only in our three official languages, but also in the language of the host country, at least for this opening session. Let me introduce briefly, we all agreed it will be very brief, our speakers today. Marcus, Marcus Schutz will give a presidential address. He is the president of this forum and the vice president for research of our association, the ISA. He's currently at the New School for Social Research in New York. Stefan Lesnig is professor at the University of München, Munich. He's an expert on post-growth, the welfare state, and aging societies. Nora, I don't see her. She's here, I saw her. Ah, like a star, she just arrives now. <laughs> so Nora Garita Bonilla is professor at the Universidad de Costa Rica and director of the Center for Research and Study of Women in this university. She will talk in English, in Spanish, and this is good, I told her before. And Jan Nederven Peterse is professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He has, a more, he has written, among other pieces, very interesting text in the field of future research and development. I am myself professor at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris, the president of the Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme. I forgot Saskia to say. I was hiding behind him. I forgot Saskia, who is a professor at Columbia University and a new member of the Collège d'Études Mondiales a new institution which I founded recently in Paris. So, I am here maybe also because I've been the president of ISA between 2006 and 2010. Wonderful times, I must say. Many friends here. So now we can start, and Marcus, please. Thank you, Michelle, for your very kind words. Dear distinguished colleagues and cherished friends, thank you all for coming here to Vienna. 
We are at a pivotal moment. We are facing profound injustices and unprecedented risks. But we are facing also unprecedented opportunities. We are at a new constellation in which mounting pressures of social and ecological problems are met by a confluence of intellectual trends that allows us to question assumptions and unleash a forward-oriented sociological imagination. Not long ago, during the 1990s, the Washington Consensus of neoliberal policies emerged so victorious from the Cold War that the end of history appeared as its mantra. In contrast, the spirit of our time, the zeitgeist, seems to be better captured by the notion of crisis. Yet, there is something puzzling about it. A financial crisis has shaken much of the world, but instead of giving way to a new economic regime, the previously established neoliberal templates persist like zombies. Billions of dollars were mobilized almost overnight to rescue banks, but austerity was imposed on the many. Today, broad sectors of European populations worry about a refugee crisis, while the refugees themselves worry about even more fundamental crises. For human livelihood on the planet, the specter of climate change has become ever harder to ignore and gives crisis yet other dimensions of meaning. The many morbid symptoms of our time seem to fit Antonio Gramsci's famous characterization of crisis as an interregnum in which the old is dying and the new cannot be born. This raises the questions. What could then lead to the new? What role could sociology play in the inventing of the new? The widespread lack of imagination, of future imagination, has been a recurrent topic in time diagnosis over the last few decades, addressed by authors as diverse as Alvin Toffler and Norbert Elias, Jürgen Habermas, Claudio Lomnitz, and Slavoj Žižek. Yet, futurist thinking does take place. It is just not well distributed. Naomi Klein has prominently shown how elites use shock during crises or constructed crises to impose blueprints faster than civil societies can mount resistance. Now our question, why can't this be turned around? What could make publics from the grassroots stronger, unleash their imaginative capacities and lend them more efficacy? What does it take to democratize futures? How do academia and the social sciences relate to anticipative thinking? The anthropologist Arjan Apadurai has recently castigated his discipline for neglecting the future. Yet, wouldn't a similar verdict apply to sociology too? Haven't we as sociologists even more spectacularly neglected the future or at least failed to address it in more explicit terms? In business schools, it is not unusual to see course offerings on the future. Marketing research is built around studies on the anticipation of consumer choices and trends. Some of the brightest students are being taught how to devise algorithms for fast-paced trading in financial derivatives so as to profit from futures before anyone else can even think about them. Yet, future courses are largely absent from the sociology curricula in most countries. Such avoidance of the future was not always the case. To the contrary, the classic founding figures of sociology were driven by their interest in the future, as religious beliefs in some telos 
gave way to the positivist search for social laws during the discipline's formative period in Western Europe. Sociologists in traditions from Auguste Comte to Emile Durkheim sought this kind of knowledge to be useful for managing or administrating society. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, Karl Marx shared underlying assumptions when he pronounced the laws of history would be pointing to a necessary triumph of the oppressed. So he did recognize in his more empirical writings that there were no historical automatisms, but plenty of maneuvering room for contingent action. The belief in an open future has been understood as the hallmark of the contemporary consciousness of time. As the historian Reinhard Koselleck noted, the space of experience and the horizon of expectation are increasingly disassociated. This fundamental contingency opens the horizon of the possible for social and political creation. What is could have been different. The existing reality could have been differently shaped through non-determined human action in more or less reflexive as well as in more or less conflictive or cooperative ways. Perhaps the absence of future engagements in sociology is a byproduct of the discipline's defensive strategy in many countries to gain respectability by emulating the supposedly rigorous methods of the hard sciences while avoiding the inherently unpredictable. I believe that the time has come to re-examine such premises in a broader way. There are at least three crucial intellectual trends that prepare the ground and shape such rethinking. First, there's increased attention to contingency and creative agency across vastly different theory types and research approaches, from the micro to the macro. This new sensibility is expressed in increased use of concepts such as creativity of action, expectation, choice, and decision, human agency, reflexivity, imagination, and a multiplicity of historical trajectories, standoffs, and scenarios. Even systems theory recognized the need to equip its systems with dynamics and an autopoietic capacity to generate futures. Let me emphasize, agency is not just about what we don't want, not merely about resistance against something, but it is also about creating entirely novel ideas and new projects. Second, the very foundation of the ISA is an attempt to connect sociologists from different countries and world regions to one another, to exchange insights that foster stronger local and national as well as global scale research. It helped to connect insights from the global south, such as the dependency approach, subaltern studies, or post-colonial thought, to the global debates. Also, the global south is still severely underrepresented in global discourse. Its intellectual impact is felt. This impact is not confined to studies of areas in the global south, but, as Deepesh Chakrabarti, Anibal Kijano and others have shown they also helped scholars in the North to recognize its relational constitution vis-a-vis -vis the South and to learn, viewing it not as a kind of universal yardstick, but as one province among others within a highly complex world. Third, Michael Burovoy's passionate advocacy of what he prominently called public sociology helped sociologists to reach out to and engage with publics, especially in countries such as the United States, where sociologists used to be largely confined to the ivory tower. The theme of this forum builds on these broad intellectual trends as it turns it to the future. Of course, the motto, the futures we want, is a bit of a provocation. 
For example, who is the we? This is intentionally left unspecified. For the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey, a public emerges around an issue, a problem, constituted by people discussing it. Likewise, the we can be a very small group or community, just as much as the imagined community of a nation or humankind. For sociologists, it's not the I that thinks in isolation, but it is the dialogue that does the thinking. Ideas are generated in interaction. Yet, the V can, of course, also be captured as a rhetorical device, creating false appearances of homogeneity, thereby depress, suppressing dissent. To emphasize diversity, the forum's motto uses the word future in its rather unusual plural. Futures in its plural does not refer to monolithic ideology nor to a totalitarian blueprint. No, it refers to the diversity of visions, projects, desires, needs, values, and wants. And yet, we do live on a finite planet on which today's technologies can drastically undermine, if not even destroy, the basis for human livelihood. The Zapatistas of Chiapas, Mexico, have expressed similar thinking beautifully in their slogan, Queremos un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos. We want a world for many worlds. The recent wave of protests around the globe challenged inequality, oppression, and ecological destruction, and insisted on the possibility of another better world. They demonstrated the malleability of futures. From the South American Andes emerged the notion of bien vivir, roughly translatable as good living, a notion that can be traced back to indigenous resistance during the colonial period and it has become a motto for contemporary struggles throughout the hemisphere. The courageous wind of change that is emanating from diverse struggles at the grassroots can inspire us to confront the mounting social and ecological pressures by directing our sociological imagination and methodological pluralism at the kind of futures that are equitable, sustainable, preferable, and yes, desirable. Setting up a forum of this magnitude is an immense work with several years of preparations. Let me thank, therefore, again, our generous host, the University of Vienna and its rector, Heinz Engel, for providing us with such a splendid setting here in the Austrian capital. Many thanks to the university staff, including Ida Seljeskog, Frank Pastner, Gary Schneider, Hannah Quince, and to the over 200 student volunteers recognizable in their bright blue shirts. Many thanks to the members of the local organizing committee led by Rudolf Richter, Many thanks to my colleagues on the ISA Executive Committee, for which I worked um, on the program, the Research Coordinating Committee, um, our president, Margaret Abraham. Very special thanks go, of course, to Isabella Balinska and her team at the ISA Executive Secretariat, who were involved in every step of the forum with the crucial experience. Additional support was graciously granted by the German Embassy in Vienna. I only wish I had more time to name each and every of the 50 program coordinators from the participating research committees, working groups, and thematic groups, along with their presidents, secretaries, and board members, who created such a splendid program through their dedicated work, through their passion, and through their intellectual leadership. Over 600 session organizers are to be thanked immensely for convening sessions that cover the whole gamut of contemporary sociology. Special thanks go also to the authors who graciously contributed their insights to the preparatory debates on the web forum at http futureswewant.net. Oh yeah, we even got a slide here. 
where over 100 articles are downloadable through open access and from which a selection is about to appear in a convenient book format. Um, so just it came out here with a very first pre-copy. Last but not least, special thanks to all of the well over 4,000 participants who have come from some 126 countries of all world regions to make this forum happen, to celebrate together a festival of ideas, a festival for learning from one another, a festival for discussing the futures we want, global sociology, and the struggles for a better world. Thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you, Marcus, for this wonderful address. Now, Saskia, Saskia, I don't forget you, unless you prefer to. to... <laughs> yes. Can I have this one? Fantastic. Um, well, I guess this works like this, right? The, really, this is an amazing amount of work that this Congress represents, and I must say. I, who grew up in um, six languages and in five countries, I don't speak a single language perfectly, including English, uh, love this type of assembly. All these different national sociological associations, you know, national here in a, in a, in a cozy sense of the term, not a strong term. And Marcus, I really am, I am so impressed. I know that there are many, many people to be recognized, but anyhow, here you were describing it all. And I think, I think the time has come to not just do the American Sociological Association for us who live in the United States. This strikes me as far more interesting, far more exciting, and more sort of tracking on the ground realities. So I want to, um, I want to talk about two types of things. One is the paradigmatic. We have clearly accumulated vast amounts of knowledge. If you think just after World War II, you know, when certain features of the social sciences, certainly in sociology, uh, are organized. You know. In the United States, I think we have taken it to a bit of an extreme, and that's my second point, which is that we have wound up with extraordinary collections of highly specialized knowledge, all housed in silos, separate silos. And the silos are multiplying like wildfire. It's just extraordinary. Within sociology today, we have so many different. And it's all good work. I, I'm not criticizing that part. But so one of the, one of the issues for me, and I, I began to develop this in my latest little book, is this notion of at what point do we have to cut across these silos? Are there problematics? Are there issues? other questions which demand from us today that we begin to, one, one image that I like to use is go back to ground level, de-theorize in order to re-theorize. And think of this vast amount of knowledge as also somewhat free-floating radicals rather than safely housed in highly specialized silos. Um, and another image that one could use is if you think of paradigmatic forms of knowledge and within sociology we have many little paradigms, supposedly a few big ones as well. Uh, perhaps today, a time when stabilized categories are sort of becoming unstable, <clears throat> perhaps today the more interesting part of the paradigmatic is not the strong center, but the fuzzy edges where, you know, you, you, the paradigm weakens. Now, I want to just give a few examples of this notion of cutting across the silos. You know, how do we begin to generate forms of knowledge, especially with the project that you just presented here, you know, to really understand where are we at. Uh, I think a lot of these silos are not the most useful format, though the knowledge that they contain may be very, very useful. Um, so, so one, one, um, one way of thinking, and I, again, I do this a little in this book, the book Expulsions, I ask, for instance, are long-term prisoners, people who have been put in jail even though they have not generated a major criminal whatever, uh, 
and long-term refugees, third-generation refugees, studied in enormous detail and very well studied by these two conditions, right? By two very, very different types of knowledge and expertise. Has the time arrived that we might actually also want to see, do they share something? They are the excluded, they are the expelled, et cetera, et cetera, without reducing the fact that they are radically different. When you begin to look like long-term homeless people in the United States, for instance, you know, there's a whole group of very distinctive figures, again, studied in great detail by very different forms of knowledge, that share something. And that something they share happens to be one of the very disturbing features of our current period, which sort of one way of putting it is we're experiencing a massive loss of habitat due to what we gently call climate change. I don't like that term anymore. I prefer talking about dead land and dead water due to uh, war, due to the gentrifying, the vast gentrifying of, the, of central cities. Many, many, many reasons growing inequality, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're dealing with transversalities. You know, we need to go back to some level that is transversal. And, and again, for me, this notion of going back to ground level, I, I do an exercise with my students, with my doctoral students at Columbia, and I say, okay, we're now going to take all of these concepts, these theoretical elements, et cetera. We're going to nail them down to the ground. The grand and the little all nailed down to the ground. Discipline, we don't, we're not sitting there nailing huh, with hammers. We are just, this is figurative. And then we're going to revisit them. Because it is quite possible that some of the dominant categories that we have and that worked very well up till a certain period, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, uh, uh, are not working as well. And that there are little elements that have been named, that have been, you know, that, 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 that we can think of as concepts, the conceptual rather than the theoretical, that might actually be extremely useful for us. Um, there is some, there was another, um, right, so, so connected to this, the whole question of how do we interpret a bit of knowledge? And here is, here is something that, that I want to sort of use as an example. So I have looked at the gold mines of Montana, which are notorious for violating all laws, for not cleaning up after themselves, sort of a profoundly American, North American, United States history of capitalism. And Norilsk, the, the very large nickel producing complex in the north of Russia, which starts as a gulag. And on and off, you know, it has a deeply communist story. So I would say that we still are dominated by a kind of form of knowledge that would look at these two as one as housed in capitalism, the other housed in communism. I interrogate that. I want to interpolate that. I would say what matters more, that one has this capitalist history and the other has a deeply communist history, or that both have an extraordinary capacity to destroy the environment. Today, under our conditions, the fact that one is communist origin and the other is capitalist is really secondary. I think it's overridden, if you want, by this question of environmental destruction. Well, and that is a very simple and I, I would hope pretty self-evident example. But you know, you can multiply that. So what is the mode in which we, yes, we accept the categories that we have, but how do we interpolate them? How do we make them work along vectors that begin to capture and enable us to deal with our current condition? Now, are my slides on? So, oops, can we fulfill the whole screen rather than just the little one? Yeah? but it doesn't show. Okay, so here I want to, to now be a bit rhetorical, spectacle. So we did this in 20 years. You know what we're looking at, right? The RLC. You look at this and you say, wow, this is a capability. It's a negative one. By the way, I really 
again, capability is a very useful term, but I refuse to simply accept that it necessarily is a positive. You know, in the English language, it has sort of embedded some positive value. I think this is a capability, it's just a negative one. And one must stand back and say, we did that in 20 years. And we did that using rather mediocre instruments. It didn't take a genius to manage to destroy the largest interior, one of the largest interior seas that we have, and to reduce it to a sliver. I'm hoping everybody can see what it is, right, that I'm showing the RLC here. Uh, and this is even worse. A billion years, poof, we just did it in 20 years. So I want to recover that in an ironic turn, clearly, right? And I would say, well, Jesus, we did that. We did it in 20 years. And we did it with mediocre instruments. This is very important. You didn't have to be a genius. There was some genius in there, probably, in some situations. But basically, we managed collectively to do this. I say that in order to signal something about capabilities that we might need develop and deploy in today's world. And that again, that we don't need geniuses. I mean, having a little genius somewhere in there, fine, you know, nothing against that. But the notion is that we can think in terms of transformations. Now I want to, I want to show a couple of slides now that have to do with how extreme a place we're in. I'm using data from the United States. I hope this has a beamer. Yeah. yeah. So here is what you want to look at. So this is corporate profits after tax. This is a one curve, one line that tells a story. And so here you have the new era begins to happen and look how it grows. And then here with neoliberalism in, wow, vertical growth curve. Then comes the crisis, which in this case, last, the, the 2008 crisis, in this case lasts about two years. I mean, a bit more maybe, but you know, very little. And then this is the significant thing. After that, after the crisis, it goes up even more. Now there again, we're dealing with a very weird capability, clearly enabled by states' monies being transferred to banks, in the case of the United States, seven trillion, to the global banking system and seven trillion in quantitative easing forms. But the main point here is that as a vast mass of people are losing ground, particular sectors thrive with that crisis. And here is an even more extreme case. This, this is corporate assets. Here, the crisis lasts about half an hour, you know, this little wrinkle here. And remember that all kinds of factories, all kinds of little operations, all kinds of households destroyed. Now the United States is an extreme case, so it makes it very clear. But these are the deep logics and tendencies that are in, today embedded in, in the kind of economic system that in the West at least we're living through. And our governments, including say a government like Germany, which is a well-run economy, they're all getting poorer. There is one little exception there. But this is just, and, and if you look at, this is 2010, and if you look further, so for instance, let's take Germany, which is a much admired, you know, it has done quite well. So debt, if you look at, you know, central government debt as a percentage of GDP, in, in 1980, it was 13%. Now, by here, it is close to 40, and in fact, now it is over 40%. So even that economy that we think, okay, they managed well, partly they managed well because they have very good sort of uh, intermediate manufacturing, machines that make machines and the world needs that, but even they are poorer, even as those corporates are richer. Now I mention this just to put on the table the urgency of rethinking, you know, the urgency of this project that Marcus has described. The final point, this is again the United States. So much money to build 10,000 buildings, which are full time, 24 hours, and endless, 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 gathering data about all of us. That is a waste of money, and that is a methodology that is not working. 
because the way they use all those data, they can never analyze all those data. The way they use it is with good old-fashioned on-the-street prejudice. Ah, here's a person that looks suspicious. Let's now go visit all that information. The way they collect the data, if it's lower Manhattan, everything gets mished up. Yeah, when you are in a, in a cafe in lower Manhattan, for instance, you open up, you have like 72 networks. We're all suspicious. You understand what I'm saying, right? Now, this is an extraordinary distortion of where we should be at. And in that sense, I really think, Marcus, that this sort of international uh, uh, association is in a way with much more promise because uh, it's not as stuck in terms of doing science and, you know, and replication, etc. So I just, um, I just leave you with those thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. And uh, Stefan, please, it's your turn. Listen. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. Um, thank you very much in, in the first place to Markus Schulz for the invitation. Thank you for being here on that great day. And apologies for reading a paper. We have been allotted in the end only 15 minutes each and I have a paper I will be reading to you in order to uh, maximize the intellectual use uh, I can make of this 15 minutes. Since Sir Karl Popper published, published back in 1945 his The Open Society and Its Enemies, the openness of liberal democracy to historical contingency, to differences in belief, to political dissent, to individual freedom, is part and parcel of the self-description of the Western world. In the times of the Cold War following the defeat of Nazi Germany, it was ideological and institutional totalitarianism of all sorts that was said to be the main enemy of the liberal democratic way of life. However, under the surface of the battle of the systems, there was a further enemy to liberal democracy and its alleged openness, usually not mentioned in the Westerners self adulating discourse, the poor countries of the so-called third world. As a matter of fact, the asserted open-mindedness of the open society clashed substantially with its closure towards the concerns and demands of the non-Western world and its populations. Even more to the point, one could say that the openness of liberal democracy was functionally dependent on building effective shields against its outer world. It is this dialectic of openness and closure I want to focus on and what follows. Today, this built-in dialectic of democratic capitalism has become most visible and is becoming ever more palpable. Confronted with migration flows unprecedented in post-war times, liberal democracies rediscover the idea of the political closure of the nation state and try to reserve the fruits of democratic capitalism to their national citizens only. At the same time, driven by the habits of prosperity, the societies in the global north fiercely hold to their industrialist model of economic development despite of the negative externalities it produces for the societies throughout the global south externalities that in turn lie at the heart of the very migration flows the rich democracies are desperately trying to confine and detain. This is basically what the paradox of democratic capitalism is about, living on the externalization of its negative effects to third parties. It is dependent on effectively immunizing itself against the potential backlash of its externalization regime. By all appearances at the beginning of the 21st century, the combination of economic coercion and moral suasion does not suffice anymore to detain the external world from counteracting and crisscrossing the global order the liberal democracies have been establishing after World War II. It is now increasingly the military option 
that has to be resorted to in order to safeguard the political, economic and social privileges we have become accustomed to. This is where Thomas Humphrey Marshall ends us the scene. Marshall, writing like Popper in the aftermath of the Great War, is the author of the authoritative sociological and, as it were, political accounts of modern liberal democracies as the homeland of what he called citizenship. Marshall reconstructs the history of modern, in his case, British society as a history of the development of citizenship as a social status being granted to ever more people and being enriched with ever more legal entitlements in the course of time. In the 20th century, citizenship encompasses a large set of civic, political, and social rights. Modernization theorist, as he ultimately was, Marshall assumed that the history of citizenship in the end was one of the gradual and irresistible inclusion of all the members of a political community into the, whole, into the scope of the whole set of rights being called for by people and being granted to them by the state. Marshall obviously was aware of the fact that the exclusion of non-citizens from the blessings of citizenship was the logical correlate to the so-called universal, universal inclusion accomplished by the modern welfare state. But this insight into citizenship as being an exclusionary mode of inclusion that did not make it to the center of his theory. However, the particularistic universalism of modern, that is, national citizenship, may be seen as its single most important feature in terms of transnational social inequality. Strictly speaking, citizenship is what economists call a club good. Club goods are defined by reflecting artificial, artificial scarcity. In principle, the access to this go these goods could be open to all, but it is arbitrarily circumscribed to and monopolized by a particular group of people. Members only is written on the door that gives entrance to citizenship and the set of rights attached to it. The doorman controlling membership at the club's door doorway are only the agents, the principal being the club members themselves who prefer to stick with one's kind and keep the doors closed. Immanuel Wallerstein gives us a parallel and yet somewhat different account to Marshall's narrative of inclusive citizenship. According to Wallerstein, people who in the capitalist economies of Europe and North America did not have access to private property and thus to life chances connected to it, indeed organized and united to fight for their civic, political and social rights, to gradually enlarge and enrich them and to exclude other groups from equal access to them. Those who initiated social movements and created organizations with which to reclaim their inclusion typically were reluctant themselves, once they had won their fight, to grant inclusion to others. They tended to act as though they wished to secure a place on a lifeboat called citizenship, Wallerstein writes, but feared that adding others after them would overload it. The boat is crowded, das Boot ist voll, is a standard German phrase claiming that the rights of citizenship are a scarce resource and that the inclusion of further beneficiaries into the community of owners of that resource would threaten to exhaust it. Wallerstein shows that in the history of Western capitalist democracy, it first was the May labor movement that contended that there were no vacancies on the left lifeboat after it had occupied its cabin, and that after women had successfully challenged the idea of not having the right to jo join the party, male and female citizens alike and together campaigned against the inclusion of so-called aliens of either sex. For those who passed the line separating citizens from non-citizens, the important thing was that there be a line, one that might keep others from passing as well. Thus, the more the notions of equality and equal rights were proclaimed as a moral principle and a political program in the Western world, the more obst obstacles, legal, economic, social, political, were instituted to prevent their effective realization. The concept of citizen has forced the creation of, Wallace, of what Wallerstein calls a long list of binary distinctions which have formed the cultural underpinnings of the capitalist world economy. First and third world, developed and underdeveloped, Christian and Muslim, civilized and barbarian, the dual categories separating the privileged from the disadvantaged Sorry.
The dual category separating the privileged from the disadvantaged, the happy few from the unfortunate masses are still in place, and to be sure, more vigorous than ever. In this regard, there obviously has been no change to the better in the so-called age of globalization, a notion that may well be said to be the post-1989 correlate to the post-1945 discourse on the open society. Openness and fluidity, hypermobility and time-space compression, the global village and the borderless world, these are only some of a myriad of catchwords around which political as well as scientific discourses on globalization have been revolving in the last two decades or so. In contrast, the limits to globalization, and above all, its asymmetries, asynchronies and inaccessibilities have been addressed much less frequently. Freedom of movement has in fact been enlarged in recent times, though not on equal terms throughout the globe, for goods, services and finance. People's freedom of movement, however, has not been enhanced in the same way. Or, to be more precise, it has been eased for some parts of the world population and restricted for others. Ronan Shamir has analyzed the dialectics of globalization in terms of enhancing some forms of spatial mobility while inhibiting others as a dual process of the constitution of guarded borders and gated communities. Process of, processes of globalization, so his argument goes, produce their own principles of closure. They are inherently associated with the prevention of movement and the blocking of access, while openness has become the hegemonic narrative in the area of, era of globalization. Closure is the dominant social mechanism reproducing and reinforcing global inequalities. In this process, the borders of the rich democracies throughout the world have been transformed into a sort of semi-permeable membrane for national, or in case of the European Union, for example, supranational citizens of the countries in the global north. It is remarkably easy to leave their countries whenever they want and come back again whenever they wish to. In contrast, for non-citizens coming from the global south, there literally is no way to get into the social container which globalization theory tells us does not exist anymore, but which obviously has a life after death. Visa policies around the globe and their historical evolution may serve as a perfect illustration of what Stefan Mao and colleagues call the emergence of the global mobility divide. Let me only very briefly assess what this divide is about. Tourism has become a major driver of transnational mobility, even more important than labor migration. In the last decades, there has been an extraordinary increase in the numbers of tourist arrivals. In 1950, 25 million tourist arrivals were counted worldwide. By 2000, the number had risen to 680 million, and by 2008, to 920 million. By now, the sound barrier of 1 billion tourist arrivals per year should, be, should have easily been broken. Now that the financial crisis that hit Europe and other parts of the advanced capitalist economies after 2008, nor the multiplication of war zones in the most recent past seem to have reversed the trend. Bombings in Turkey or tsunamis in Thailand do not impair the Westerners' mobility, but only make them change travel plans and choose another holiday destination in another part of the world. However, international tourism is not an instrument of global social integration, but rather a mirror of the fragmentation and even dualization of the so-called world society. Visa policies are the major instrument for regulating and controlling the global flow of people. The number of countries a German citizen like me can visit without a visa is 129. Only Finns, Danes and US citizens outperforming him or her, me, with 130. Turkey, for example, ranks number 77 of the world in terms of travel freedom, with visa-free access to 52 countries. Thailand, number 137, 29 countries. But still, Turks or Thais are lucky if compared to citizens of Vietnam, 80 con 18 countries, the Democratic Republic of Congo, 16 countries, or, jumping to the end of the list, Afghanistan, with 12 countries with visa-free access. The access or not to visa waivers has become a major stratifying factor in the global social hierarchy. Not surprisingly, OECD countries benefit disproportionately from visa waiver programs, while they tend to impose visa restrictions on other countries outside the OECD world. What is more, the inequality in terms of visa-free travel has increased substantially over the past 40 years, that is, in times of alleged globalization. 
Since the late 1960s, there has been a clear polarization of mobility rights, with citizens of rich countries maximizing their travel options and people from poor regions being retained in their countries. At the beginning of the 2000s, one half of the world population could travel without visa only to less than 25 countries. Two-thirds two of the world population um, to less than 35 countries. Compared to the most, more than 120 countries, all the citizens of the most privileged nations can freely choose as the objects of their travel desire. The so-called liberal Western countries have thus heavily influenced the global mobility regime to their advantage. Polish sociologist Sigmund Baumann gets to the heart of the story when observing that this mobility regime encourages traveling for profit and, we may add, for recreation, adventure or fun. In contrast, traveling for survival is condemned. To be sure, the institutionalization of freedom of mobility for some and its effective denial to others is only one out of the multiplicity of reflections and materializations of what I call the externalization society. Be it by way of mobility divides and social closure, or through unequal economic and ecological exchange, the externalization society practices the politics of opportunity hoarding and cost shifting at the expense of the resources and life chances in the countries of the global south. Put in a nutshell, the instruction manual for externalization professionals reads pretty simple. First rule, exploit nature, use cheap labor, sell your goods, and monopolize ecological things at some place out there in the world. Second rule, enhance prosperity, promote mass consumption, organize intelligent and clean production, and grant social rights at home. And third rule, see to it that the access to the outer world is open while preventing the outer world from having access to your own world. Arguably, these instructions have been followed by the rich democracies in the global north since the very beginnings of the history of Western modernity. While externalization dynamics were exacerbated and, in a way, perfected after World War II, it seems that today we are not only reaching the limits to the seemingly irresistible growth and reproduction of this de developmental model, but at the same time, there is ever more evidence of externalization coming home. Ongoing climate change, and the acute so-called refugee crisis may be seen as manifestations of nature and people, the outside and the outsiders, finally accepting the toll for decades of exploitation, obstruction and abuse of power by the world's happy few. A privileged minority which is not composed only by, of, of those 62 people who were recently identified by the charity Oxfam as being as wealthy as half of the world population. The truth is that in terms of global social inequality, it is all of us in the global north who are the privileged ones and who take pleasure in living beyond the means of others. I'm coming to the last paragraph. It should come as no surprise then that those others are now, report, now reporting back to us, reminding us of their underprivileged existence. Ayelet Shahar has written extensively about the birthright lottery. Citizenship is acquired by purely accidental circumstances of being born at one place of the world or the other while gaining privileges by purely arbitrary criteria is discredited in virtually all fields of public life in liberal democracies, birthright entitlements are perfectly normal and legitimate when it comes to allotting and justifying the access to citizenship rights. When the going gets rough, citizenship rights cross-cut and even outdo human rights. Why should those who drew a blank in the birthright lottery, those who are excluded from the whole range of life chances and opportunities we are simply taking for granted, why should they keep on playing by the rules we have imposed on them? It does seem to me that there is no convincing answer to this question, at, at least non-convincing to those who eventually have decided to question the rules. The costs of open societies living in splendid, one-sided isolation from the world surrounding them have gone out of control and have become unbearable for those who have been paying for it for decades and generations now. Uncovering openness as an ideological discourse and unveiling externalization as an instrument of power and domination is what a critical sociology of social inequalities may contribute to the trans transformation of a global society that is transforming itself anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, Nora will speak in Spanish, but we can read on the screen in English what she's going to tell us. So Nora, muchas gracias.
¿Me dices cuándo empieza? No, no, bueno, ¿qué futuros queremos? ¿Y qué significa ese queremos? ¿Quiénes? decía Marcos. ¿Quiénes queremos? Yo quisiera plantear hoy que las semillas, las propuestas del futuro, están en las acciones, las resistencias y los movimientos sociales que hoy se están desarrollando. Y yo voy a hablar de algunos, porque la cantidad y la variedad es enorme, de los que ocurren en América Latina. Excusez-moi, je m'adresse aux gens qui ont la responsabilité de faire... Uh, I'm talking, excuse me, I'm speaking French now. <laughs> There, there, is, there is a problem with subtitles that don't appear here, so please, in English, at least. But if you want, we can continue in French too. Is it... Who knows? Who knows? Ah, yeah. yeah. Here we are. Los futuros, en plural, que queremos y quiénes queremos. Yo planteo que debemos, como sociólogos, mirar los movimientos, las resistencias, las acciones colectivas, donde están las semillas del futuro. Quiero hacer, para empezar, una precisión respecto a ese título de pueblos en movimiento. No me refiero a la categoría pueblo, que sería una totalidad imposible, una esencialización. Cuando digo pueblos, me refiero a la palabra, al término que se da y se daba a las aldeas indígenas durante el periodo de la colonización española en América y cuya existencia aún hoy día es la presencia viva de la colonialidad en nuestro continente América. La expresión la escuché de una maya quiché, una mujer socióloga indígena, que dijo, no soporto los sociólogos que nos dicen que somos un movimiento social. No somos un movimiento social, somos pueblos en resistencia. Y a mí me impactó mucho esa frase porque quiere decir que ella estaba señalando algún límite o incompletud a las teorías sobre movimientos sociales. Recuerden ustedes que Marx, por ejemplo, decía que el capitalismo creó sociedad, pero destruyó comunidad. Entonces, tal vez hay ahí una primera imposibilidad de la teoría social de comprender ciertas lógicas comunitarias. Yo quisiera hablarles de todo el abanico de los movimientos y las acciones que hay en América Latina, pero es imposible. Me voy a concentrar en dos. Lo que quieren las mujeres en América Latina y qué aporte les están dando a las ciencias sociales y los movimientos indígenas y qué aporte le hacen a nosotros los sociólogos y a los científicos sociales en general. Pero antes de hablar un poquito de los diferentes feminismos, quiero recordarles algo de la historia de las luchas de las mujeres. Las luchas de las mujeres en Europa tuvieron que cuestionar aquel sujeto abstracto de la Declaración de los Derechos Humanos. Todos los hombres son iguales. Ah, sí, pero las mujeres no estaban incluidas ahí. Entonces, las feministas, al impugnar ese sujeto universal abstracto, tuvieron que hablar de la mujer, pero al hacerlo construyeron otro sujeto esencializado, mujer. Es desde los bordes donde se impugna ese sujeto abstracto. El feminismo afrochicano se planteó la categoría de interseccionalidad como una articulación de clases, sexos, sexualidades, raza. Los feminismos poscoloniales hicieron entender que ese sujeto abstracto mujer invisibiliza la multiplicidad de condiciones de la mujer. Por ejemplo, la expresión mujer del tercer mundo era una abstracción que ocultaba diversidades y tenía escasa utilidad para comprender la situación de las mujeres. 
Es decir, había una brecha teoría-lugar. ¿Por qué digo esto? Porque voy a hablarles de varios feminismos, muchos feminismos que hay en América Latina. Tiene que ver con esa diversidad de esos sujetos. Por ejemplo, en América Latina, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui y las feministas comunitarias bolivianas han hecho muchos trabajos y muchas luchas revelando las complejidades complejas de ese sujeto abstracto y ellas se deslindan, se delimitan de los estudios decoloniales en Estados Unidos para plantear que en la India y en América Latina debemos hablar de descolonial. Sí. Por la urgencia de las luchas. No hay sonido. Mic check, mic check. Este funciona bien, este bueno. funciona ahora. Pero mejor, no, por aquí, aquí. ¿no? como quieras. O sea, me lo hicieron a mi tamaño. Bueno, entonces, digamos que vamos a hablar de varios feminismos. ¿Qué están sembrando de futuro las feministas urbanas de clase media y alta? Bueno, ellas han luchado por la ampliación de la ciudadanía, por ser incluidas en la democracia, han dado importantes luchas contra el femicidio y todas las formas de violencia con la mujer, como el movimiento Ni Una Menos en Argentina, que es bastante fuerte hoy día. Hay, sin embargo, divergencias entre estos feminismos y los feminismos indígenas. Los feminismos urbanos, estas mujeres de clase media y alta, dicen que las feministas indígenas son sexistas. Y las feministas indígenas dicen que es el etnocentrismo de aquellas otras feministas que no comprenden su visión comunitaria porque ellas incluyen siempre a los hombres, siempre los resuelven de manera comunitaria en las luchas contra el patriarcado y todas las luchas comunitarias que dan. Es muy interesante lo que estos feminismos están cuestionando y están teorizando y están sembrando como futuro. Por ejemplo, cuestionan la separación ser humano-naturaleza. Cuestionan el logocentrismo eurocéntrico, porque ellas son sentipensantes y cosmosintientes. Su punto de partida para la reflexión es ser un cuerpo de mujer atravesado por la cultura, abriendo paso así, como lo había hecho Franz Fanon, al pensamiento situado. Hay un punto común entre esos feminismos urbanos los feminismos comunitarios y otros ecofeminismos, que es justamente pensarse, ser un locus de denunciación desde un cuerpo de mujer, cuerpo-territorio, dicen ellas. Cuerpo-territorio violentado desde la conquista de América hasta la fecha, pasando por las violaciones de guerra en tiempos de la guerra en Guatemala, las muertes actuales en Ciudad Juárez, en México, o los femicidios en todo el continente. Han sido los feminismos de América Latina que en su práctica y al volver la mirada sobre la vida cotidiana han mostrado lo que la teoría social ocultaba y han iniciado, a mi manera de ver, lo que Boaventura de Sousa llama la sociología de las ausencias y de las emergencias. Los movimientos indígenas en América Latina, sobre todo en Bolivia y Ecuador, han planteado desde sus prácticas preguntas, por ejemplo, sobre el sujeto revolucionario. Han dado guerras, las guerras por el agua, las guerras por el gas en Bolivia, luchas actuales en Ecuador, y todos han hecho profunda huella histórica. En su lucha por la defensa de los bienes comunes ante intervenciones del Estado o de proyectos transnacionales avalados por los Estados, y en sus luchas por lograr que la Constitución en Bolivia y en Ecuador se enunciara como un Estado con muchas naciones, 
han hecho realmente un, un trayecto histórico importante. La gestión de los bienes comunes y las luchas por la defensa de las lógicas comunitarias ha demostrado que ni el Estado ni el mercado son los únicos administradores de los bienes comunes, tal como lo ha señalado Elinor Olstrom, cuyos estudios permitieron observar que, la cito, el uso sustentable de los recursos naturales compartidos puede ocurrir aunque no exista propiedad individual o estatal. Los aportes de estos movimientos indígenas han ido mucho más allá, porque ellos cuestionan la linealidad de las concepciones de desarrollo y ya no adjetivan el desarrollo, que si desarrollo sustentable, que si desarrollo sostenible, proponen desde sus conmovisiones la pacha mama, que no es un sinónimo del concepto occidental de naturaleza. La Pachamama es un modo de entenderse como parte de una comunidad social y ecológicamente ampliada. En ese sentido, sus propuestas podemos llamarlas post-desarrollo, es decir, una desconstrucción de la idea de desarrollo que partió de la división ser humano-naturaleza. Hay un punto común entre los movimientos indígenas, los movimientos campesinos y toda la gama, todo el abanico de los feminismos latinoamericanos contra el extractivismo, que son las propuestas en torno al buen vivir o vivir bien ancestral, que no pretende un retorno a siglos anteriores, sino a modernidades alternativas, que superan la lógica de medios afines capitalistas a favor de una lógica por la vida. El buen vivir retoma prácticas y saberes ancestrales, pero no significa un retroceso a modalidades anteriores, sino una desconstrucción del desarrollo en busca de alternativas al desarrollo mismo. Hablaba Marcus del movimiento zapatista. Bueno, yo también quiero añadir algo, porque es un movimiento que hay que observar. Está construyendo propuestas en el presente, que nos alumbran visiones hacia el futuro. Voy a mencionar algunas nada más. Su concepción de democracia, mandar obedeciendo. Una subversión de las jerarquías de género. Las mujeres son comandantes y los hombres son los subcomandantes. Su lucha no es por el conservadurismo cultural, sino que es una ruptura con esa racionalidad medios afines y una apuesta por la racionalidad de la vida. Las comunidades indígenas no son estadocéntricas. Eso también marca las reflexiones de los zapatistas. Los caracoles zapatistas son espacios de construcción de gestión de los comunes. El zapatismo no busca esencialismos indígenas, sino que construye alternativas transgresoras. Es decir, anuncia una, model una modernidad alternativa. La riqueza de las acciones, resistencias, acciones colectivas es enorme, pero hay aún muchas descritas por los sociólogos, pero no completamente teorizadas. Y yo siempre lo señalo porque creo que este es un momento propicio para la sociología, para crear nuevas categorías y para renovar los enfoques teóricos. A la larga tradición del pensamiento crítico latinoamericano se añaden hoy categorías y conceptos que se han ido construyendo junto con los movimientos sociales, por ejemplo, la categoría extractivismo, otras eh, conceptos, conceptos horizonte, cuerpo territorio, entronque patriarcal, colonialidad del género, extraexión, buen vivir y muchísimos avances, incluso en leyes, de los derechos de la naturaleza. Nosotros no podríamos contestar esa pregunta de ¿Qué futuros queremos a partir de fantasías? Yo creo que lo podemos construir mirando justamente esas luchas, esas semillas de futuro que nos están sembrando los movimientos y las acciones colectivas. Yo les quiero contar que para los indígenas en América Latina el tiempo no es lineal, el tiempo es circular. Hay una palabra en quechua que designa el pasado, pero que es la palabra que designa el espacio adelante. 
Vean qué interesante, para las comunidades indígenas, el futuro está en el pasado. Entonces yo creo que con esta lógica nosotros podemos mirar en lo que ha sido construido y se está construyendo, es decir, en los espacios solidarios, ya sea en torno a las luchas por los bienes comunes, los espacios solidarios de los barrios, en las tomas de las fábricas, fábricas recuperadas, en los barrios seguros, en las resistencias, ahí están las semillas de futuro. Es decir, en este pasado y este presente está el futuro. Vean ustedes qué interesante, cómo en estas luchas por los bienes comunes podemos ver chispas de futuro. Pero hay un punto de convergencia con otras luchas a escala global, como por ejemplo las de libre acceso a la producción intelectual, el derecho a transitar una ciudad sin violencia. Algunos eh, teóricos, o eh, por ejemplo el economista Pierre Salamá, nos dice, no olvidemos que vivimos en un mundo donde lo mercantil es lo dominante. Sin embargo, digamos que está bien para que no seamos ingenuos, pero eso no disminuye el hecho de que hay a partir de las luchas por los bienes comunes, un punto global de convergencia. De ahí que surge esa teoría del común que algunos autores están trabajando, cito a Dardot y Laval, que dicen que el común es el principio político que va a definir un nuevo régimen de las luchas a escala mundial. Vean, ya me están diciendo que me calle, pero observen. Desde esas luchas, con muchos hilos, se está tejiendo, se está haciendo un tejido. Yo creo que ese tejido es una propuesta pluriversal que significa, espero, un cambio civilizatorio. No, no linguistic comment, but everybody must take very seriously what happened. Jan, por favor. Oh, just let me make a, sorry, a comment uh, because of the technical problem. The text went too fast, I learned. Uh, so, but uh, instead of that, I think we will uh, publish that on our web page. So thank you very much. And a good early evening to you all, and thanks to many. A friend said to me a while ago, these are dark times, and we couldn't finish the conversation, but I kept thinking about it, and this is a way to continue the conversation. How do I get to the next slide? This one? This one. I did. Uh, no. Please put to the next slide. So, um, uh, a quick note on where we are. Uh, how did we get there? Uh, we walk back the cat. 62 billionaires own as much as half the world's population. Why is that? Is it because of major systemic structural dynamics? Capitalism, capitalist system, not very likely. Scandinavia, for instance, is different. It is because of political design and political engineering, the agency of the 1% with media and institutions asleep at the wheel. Their doing has been eroding, has taken decades, but now it's working eroding social contracts, social cohesion, erodes nationalism. So people, for instance in Britain, are asking, common project, what was that again? What is the common project? And we have a globalization for the few, not for the many, globalization in quote marks, because not in the sense of connectivity, which is all ours, but because it is corporate globalization, we get a multiculturalism with disincentives because many people are experiencing a double squeeze, one by neoliberal uh, and, and austerity forces 
and another by um, uh, the way immigrants are integrating. So the UK shrinks to little England, populism that is left and right, and folks, under the circumstances, this is normal in the sense it is what we would expect because crazy is part of the new normal. <laughs> no, next one. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Some of the positives, folks. Major social movements, Occupy Wall Street, for instance, find major political expressions. The Bernie Sanders campaign really has momentum and energy. Indignados with Podemos, uh, the Five Star Movement, and so forth, which is part of a wider legitimacy crisis of institutions, paradigms, part of which is, it works, it works. <laughs> um, we are living interesting times, turning points. We have reached a tipping point in that. The very organizations that have been implementing, propagating neoliberalism are turning a another page. The IMF chief economist Ostri and colleagues published a paper a month ago. Neoliberalism has been oversold is the title. The paper says for decades we have been promoting growth. Growth? What about redistribution? Um, a few weeks later, uh, two weeks ago, appeared a re IMF report on the United States economy which identifies five threats to the American economy, three of which have to do with inequality. Because if you have growth, if you have supply, gosh, it would be nice if there is demand as well. Um, free trade is in question, is now um, opposition to uh, TTIP, and, and, and TPP plays a part in several elections. Panama Papers has drawn attention to the issue of tax uh, evasion. Brexit, one meaning of it is, yes, London may secede as a citadel of, of finance. In the United States, Elizabeth Warren joining Clinton campaign widens the platform, doesn't it then? Um, in France, unions are protesting the flexibilization of the labor market. And um, in finance, Japan, United States, European Union have been injecting over the past seven years or so liquidity into financial markets in the order of 25 trillion dollars and now even in central banks who have been doing uh, this criticism is growing because there's a realization that this doesn't go into real assets real economy it's adding to financial asset asset bubbles ECB had a bright idea that quantitative easing must be actually coordinated with emerging economies so that the effects are, are balanced. There is also an increasing recognition that in an era of low yield, below zero interest rates, how do you make money in finance? Very easy, by cheating. Fraud is normal in finance. And people are now aware of that, and Carviel and the movie that are, 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 are part of that. Um, <clears throat> wow. Wow. Okay, good. At a global level. Let us recognize that our era is part of a pattern shift in which a global north-south hegemony in the order of 200 years 
is giving way to an east-south pattern or a south-south pattern. Uh, the BRICS and their new development bank contingency reserve arrangement is part of this. And recently, they, they propose also to set up their own credit rating agency. And these are uh, these demonstrate new centers of influence um, in indicators of multipolarity. Now, China initiates One Belt, One Road, New Silk Road, Maritime Silk Road, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, which put, put together a $3 trillion global surplus recycling. Varoufakis has been talking about GSRM, Global Surplus Recycling Mechanism. This is a big one. And it connects East Asia, Eurasia, Europe. Um, and here China is investing in infrastructure, in real economy, um, with major ramifications for Central Asia, West, West Asia, and wider horizons. And... Um, so she says, yeah, no, she says, yeah, say in, in Korea, that's an old dream. A train connection from Busan to Paris. And now, in Korea, well, maybe this is going to actually take shape. Um, so this is a major Chinese investment in regional economy and global economy, in which China is doing just what the others are not doing, investment in real economy, infrastructure, boosting trade uh, and investment. This is the most grandiose project of interconnectivity in decades, in the, including the past century, much larger in volume and impact resources, commitments in vision than the Marshall Plan, the Alliance for uh, Progress, and so forth. Now, let us give thanks to Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, Edgar Snowden, and those who released the Panama Papers for contributing to the futures we want. Oh, a bit of negatives, folks, in advanced economies, authoritarian trends, authoritarian trends. This is all too familiar. Eh? Need it be spelled out then? In the United States, Trump and police violence and guns and so forth. We know it all. In Europe, in some governments, right-wing trends, in the European Union, democratic deficit has been on the agenda for decades. What is ever being done about it? Um, NATO and European Union pressure on Russia via roping in Ukraine as a buffer state is unsmart, unwise and unnecessary. So the movements increase their influence, but their influence is not conclusive in the central nodes of power. In uh, emerging economies and developing countries in Latin America, um, the pink tides may be turning. And authoritarian trends in, in Thailand, in Malaysia, and the Philippines, and Egypt are, of course, all familiar. The governance failures in Venezuela and Cuba, and these all together imply a major lesson. The more progressive a party or a government is, the greater their responsibility for policy competence. The IMF now, post crisis, as we all know, is making a comeback. It was the master of disaster in the 90s, the Asian crisis. And um, now, is making a, 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 a comeback, and the IMF has been changing its perspective, but its policy, not so much. 
Uh, a few more points. Um, a big, the story of financialization is being underestimated and under-researched. A big part is the investment that goes, a pattern shift from the real economy to financial assets because they're profitable, they're liquid, etc. And in addition, regulation, sorry to say, nearly hopeless. The shadow banks inside credit, etc., etc. And the, that super cycle that now is moving towards a China requires great deafness. A note on the Middle East. The United States, since the Suez crisis, has claimed hegemony over the Middle East and has had partners in Israel and Saudi Arabia. Arabia. And part of their model is war and walls, so that defense, border defense, tax, smart walls and surveillance is part of the situation. And the sponsorship of a conservative Islam, which now is spreading, has also been part of the situation. Some stuff is, in, is ambiguous. The art of Jeff Koons, is it positive or is it negative? Uh, the Asian middle class taking over from the American middle class, nice for the world economy, um, not so for ecology, and what are these people then, what are they laughing about? They are laughing about the idea of dividing trends into positive and negative. And second, they are laughing about the idea of striking a balance. Well, how would we strike a balance then? By what criteria or methodology? Um, I say just two points, and then I end. We look at science fiction, the pattern is always the same. It shows advanced technology and medieval morality. The point of caution is that even though art types are emotionally anchored and we all carry ancestral memories of oppression and violence, we should not recycle it and factor in advancement of thinking and moral a refinement. Then, a brave new multipolar world is emerging, and if the balance of energies now is as it is, in Amsterdam they say it could be worse, so it will be at least in 20, 200 years. Thanks. <laughs> So, I have, I have been not such a good president, not such a good chair, because I should have been given also 15 minutes, but it's late. I will take just 10 minutes or less to emphasize on six points in my comment. Uh, the general idea being that we are at a moment of an intellectual turn within sociology. My first point is that till recently, there was a deep feeling that uncertainty, difficulty, and so on, make the world in which we live more and more dangerous, difficult, that the idea of progress, or at least of social progress, was not longer accepted. And what appears here in these papers is, on the contrary, the idea that a better world is maybe ambiguously possible, that there is a future that the idea of progress is not totally obsolete, and that we are at a moment when to, we have maybe to face a real civilization, civilizational change, or at least we need it. So my first point is, thank you, Marcus, to say something like, return to the futures. And to say it, return with sociological imagination for the older generations, this is good. But. The second important point is that if we can imagine a better world, if we can consider that there is some futures, it is first of all due to the action of collective actors. Social movements, struggles, protests bring the possibility of a better world. And not necessarily technocrats, elites, economic or political leaders. 
Usually, social movements is just one among many other fields of issues in sociology. Opening this forum with this idea of collective action, admitting that social movements are a central perspective, that they are part of the core of sociology, means that we are criticizing these analyses that only have interest in the center, that are only top-down. No, we must show interest in the horizontal, in the neighborhoods that you study, Saskia, in excluded people, in non-citizens that were quoted by Stefan, in all these actors that introduce logics from below, bottom-up, in the pueblos in movimiento, in feminism, decolonization, and so indigenous perspective, and so on. And for me, this is very important, having a strong interest for collective action. So also, thank you, Marcus, for that. My third point is that maybe there are some limits with the vocabulary, that is to say, with the categories that we use. And even this category of social movements needs some debate, maybe some protest. In the 60s or in the 70s, there were two main sociological schools that liked to discuss the concept of social movement. We had to be with Touraine or with Tilly, to say it very briefly. Well, today I think we can have other ways of debating, and we can also see that what we used to call social movements are cultural, civic, ethical, and that the social itself is not necessarily the main point, even if it was important to speak of inequalities, as that has been the case tonight. So we must invent new concepts, new tools, new analytical categories, maybe also new methods in, or, in order to analyze correctly new forms of action. We need empirical work, field work, but we need theory too. This is absolutely clear. And of course, we must be critical. But if we want to introduce new concepts and new methodology, that means also that we must redefine pluridisciplinarity. I was very interested by the idea that pluridisciplinarity is not only working with people from different disciplines. It's something else. We have no time to discuss this. But we have not only to learn from, but to work with other peoples and peoples that belong to scientific or academic disciplines. So we could have a debate on pluridisciplinarity. But listening to what was said about poor people, refugees, imprisoned people, and so on, I was thinking to something else. Yes, it's important to study struggles, social movement, whatever the vocabulary you use. It is not easy always. It is not easy, comfortable. It can be dangerous. And I would like just to remember us that recently an Italian sociologist died in Cairo, Giulio Regeni, because he was working on some collective action. And we must also know that some of our colleagues in many different situations, including, for instance, in Turkey, have to deal with authoritarian regimes that don't let so easily work on collective action struggles and so on. It's not easy. It can be dangerous. So we should also think about the responsibility of everybody here. My point number five or six, I don't remember. I would like to say something. What is very important with these, let us call them new, new, new social movements, struggles, and so on, and that it is very difficult for them to articulate with the political level. They have big discussions. It's not. You cannot just say Podemos and Indignados, for instance, because the relationship between Indignados, the movement, and Podemos, the political actor, is not so obvious. I don't say it's not a criticism, but this is just to say that for these new actors, struggles, and so on, the relationship with political systems, that seems so archaic, so far from the real life in many situations, or so dangerous, Trump and so on. So the relationship is really a key point for us. So I had other remarks, but I just want to finish with one point. 
if we have a strong interest for futures, we must have also a strong interest for the past. And if we have a strong interest for the past, it means that sociology and history must be articulated. It is never easy. I will just give one example. If you have a strong interest for the so-called revolutions in the Arab and Muslim world, five or six years ago it started. For sociologists, it was wonderful. Well, five years after, Tunisia is OK, or more or less OK. But then if you visit Egypt, Libya, Syria, and so on, it's a disaster. From a sociological perspective, we were right, those among us, that were having a strong, positive interest for these revolutions. But from an historical perspective, we can have a very different uh, analysis. So I don't say historians are right, sociologists are not right, or the country. I just say among these issues of pluridisciplinarity, the relationship between history and sociology should be a very important point. If we really want to have a better future, we must not forget historical past. So thank you. Now it's really opened. And let us come discuss. And there is a big party now. Thank you.